Oh, I found it. They've hidden it. It's no longer its own button. It's now hiding under something else. So anyway, um, thank you for joining us all today. Um, like I said, I'm Greg Mann, the Transportation Policy Director at A Thousand Friends of Wisconsin. Um, and we're really excited to be joined by two excellent speakers today. Um, really people at the forefront of electric buses um, and real experts that we're excited to have. Um, and I know that they're excited to be here. Um, so yeah, we're, we're joined today by uh, Susan Mudd, who's with the Environmental Law and Policy Center, who's really doing an excellent and, and kind of uh, on the forefront of tracking where school buses, especially electric school buses, are being rolled out in the Midwest. Um, you know, I've seen quoted in newspapers and articles around the Midwest. So just a real expert. We're so excited to have her here. Going to learn about uh, all the school buses that have been put in uh, in Wisconsin. 65 buses just announced. I'm getting too deep in the weeds, stealing your thunder a little bit. Um, we're also joined by Trevor Young, who's the uh, City of Racine's transit manager. Um, they have been doing an unbelievable job getting electric buses in Racine. Um, I believe 12 buses now, Trevor, if that's correct. I, uh, it's really on the, they're on the cutting edge in Wisconsin when it comes to electrifying their transit fleet. So that's awesome. Um, so anyway, really excited to have these two amazing experts here. Um, and we're just gonna jump right into it. Um, you know, just some ground rule basics. We've We've turned off the ability for people to turn their camera on or to unmute yourselves. Um, it just makes this whole process a lot simpler, um, but feel free to engage in chat. Um, if you have questions, um, we'll be, you know, post them as we go along. I'll be collecting them. We'll, we'll be collecting them till the very end and we'll have a Q and A session where we'll get to your questions. Um, and then, um, you know, we have a recording that's going on right now. We'll be sending this out to you afterwards with links and everything that's been mentioned. Um, so yeah, um, we'll just dive right into it. Um, so, you know, we always like to remind people, what is a thousand friends of Wisconsin? Um, we're a land use and planning nonprofit that was founded in 1996. Um, we work to make communities more sustainable and livable in Wisconsin. Um, and we also run a number of programs throughout the state. We're a statewide organization. Um, Susan, my colleague who's on here runs Active Wisconsin, which is a coalition of communities and advocacy groups from around the state that are dedicated to making walking and biking infrastructure, tons of resource sharing, state level advocacy there. So, um, you know, we have our fingers in a lot of pies and, and we're really excited about that stuff. And, and so if you wanna learn more about that, head to our website, a thousand friends of Wisconsin.org. Um, we also have social media, we're on Twitter, um, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook. I, we're also on LinkedIn now too. We're finding that's kind of a fruitful place as well for nonprofits. So we just kind of started that and check us out there as well. Um, and what else is going on? We have a, a lot of great news and it's, this is probably the hardest section for us to, to do because it's just how do I pick one thing to share with you all. Um, but for me personally, one of the amazing things that's going on is that Susan is now running a community transportation academy. Um, this is like a, a free 10 week course that's happening in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, helping community advocates and transportation, uh, you know, folks interested in transportation, engage with their local governments, um, get the skills and knowledge to advocate for safe and accessible transportation and, and to become a transportation advocate. Um, this is a model, this Transportation Academy is a model that's started in Portland, Oregon, and then has spread across the country. Um, and as far as I can tell, this is the first one in Wisconsin, I'm hoping to maybe the first of many, Susan. Um, so if you know folks uh, in La Crosse who are interested in this, um, you know, it's a 10-week course. They're on Wednesdays. Um, there'll be some in-person, some virtual, um, and we have that on our website, and hopefully Susan's posting a link to her chat. So anyway, if that's interest, of interest to you, or you know some folks in La Crosse who you, this would work uh, for, you know, be sure to reach out to Susan um, and uh, jump in, because this is going to be a really exciting new uh, idea. So anyway, enough of me on the soapbox. Uh, I'm going to throw it over now to Susan Mudd, um, who is with the Environmental Law and Policy Center, who's uh, going to be sharing about all the great stuff are happening around electric school buses here in Wisconsin. So, Susan, I'll throw it over to you. And I, I know you're, we'll give you some time to get your screen shared and everything. Oh, That's perfect. Looks great. Okay. 
Well, first of all, welcome everybody. It's fun to see an old friend, Sherry Gruder, among the audience, but it's really fun to be talking with folks in uh, Wisconsin. I lived there for many years, um, still have relatives there and get there when I can. And it's really an honor to have been asked to be part of this event today. Um, I'm gonna be speaking specifically about electric school buses and where things are um, in Wisconsin. Um, so first of all, quickly, why electric school buses. Um, as you probably know, um, school buses transport about 25 million kids a day across the US. It's actually the largest form of public transportation in our country. Um, while we support um, and think it's wonderful when kids can walk or bicycle to school, and that's clearly best, but most kids, um, because of our land use patterns, something which a thousand friends is painfully aware of, uh, most kids don't have that opportunity in our country anymore. Um, and the buses that uh, these 25 million kids a day are riding in this country are predominantly over 95% are diesel. Why is that a problem? Because uh, diesel pollution affects children's lung development and contributes to childhood asthma attacks. Um, uh, and specifically kids who are um, either asthmatic or have any other um, disabilities who rely on wheelchairs, excuse me, those who rely on wheelchairs are often stuck waiting the longest um, to get on a bus and to get off a bus and their entrance is usually near the tailpipe at the end. Um, so really uh, problematic, the current situation. Um, there are some communities which have tried no idling ordinances. While these are a great idea, uh, our experience is that they are rarely, if ever, enforced. And so a great idea, but generally aren't actually protecting the students or the drivers or others, the teachers and staff who are waiting near, near school buses to both load and unload uh, each day. So why electric school buses? Um, because if we got kids out of old dirty diesel school buses, a University of Michigan School of Public Health uh, study found that we could uh, save 14 million school day absences per year um, by getting kids into cleaner, cleaner buses such as electric. Um, we could also uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from buses. You can see the Argonne uh, uh, fleet calculation there showing we could save 10.3 tons of greenhouse glasses and gas emissions per year per bus. Um, we could also save on the health costs, uh, both of the kids, but also the parents uh, and teachers. Um, also, it's been found that if we get kids away from diesel into cleaner buses, uh, the evidence shows higher academic performances. This could be due both to the fumes, but also to the noise that kids and drivers are exposed to in riding diesel buses. Um, any of you who've ridden a school bus remember um, how loud they are. Kids uh, end up having to scream to hear each other. That leaves both the kids and the drivers uh, more on edge, uh, less calm, less ready to learn when they get to school. So um, this is a, a figure put together by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. It basically shows, I'm not sure if you can see the numbers, I apologize if they're too small, but basically showing massive reductions in greenhouse gases, nitrogen oxides, which as you know, contribute to ground level smog as well as um, other problems, as well as the fine particles uh, that carry many uh, pollutants and toxins into our lungs, massive reductions in all of those from moving away from diesel to electric, and especially as the grid keeps getting cleaner um, to electric charge with renewables. Okay, so it used to be the fact that we could talk about this, but there weren't really available options. Now, every single major school bus manufacturer has at least one, and in some cases, multiple models of electric school buses. There are now more than 20 on the market available today. The problem is that these buses um, are still quite expensive. They tend to be approximately three times the cost of a new diesel. Um, and that's a real serious problem for many, if not all, school districts. Um, so why, given that, um, and how can we make the transition away from diesel towards electric? The, the problem that I mentioned is the upfront cost. Um, it's the cost of the bus itself as well as the charger that makes them more expensive on the front end. However, there are some offsetting costs right away. Um, the major one being that the fuel costs themselves are less 
So electricity per mile traveled is cheaper than diesel. And that's even before the war in Ukraine and the recent problems where uh, diesel has spiked. Even before that, um, it was already true that electricity prices, even though we all like to complain about them, are definitely cheaper uh, than diesel. Secondly, and also very important, the maintenance costs of electric buses are much less um, than diesel. Why? At least for, an, for a school bus, there are literally thousands less parts, less to maintain, less, to, less filters to change, et cetera. So the total savings over the life of the bus um, may approach, already approach in some cases, um, total cost of ownership that's similar, um, but there's, there's still that upfront barrier. So um, this just shows some of the operational savings that are being experienced in other places that already have electric school buses. Um, for instance, Twin Rivers School District um, has already shown uh, tremendous savings, um, but there are examples in Michigan, in Minnesota, and other neighboring states already. Um, VW settlement funds. In many states across the country, uh, the VW scandal and the settlement that resulted in it uh, led to, um, well, every single state got money from the VW settlement. Um, many states, uh, chose to use some of that money to help start the transition of school bus fleets. Um, it's a painful story that I'm not going to get into now, but I'm glad to answer questions. Wisconsin, as some of you know, because of other um, electric vehicle fights going on there, Wisconsin did not choose to use any of its funds for electric school buses. I think Trevor may have some good news for us about electric transit buses, but anyway. Um, so Wisconsin did get 67 million um, in VW settlement funds. Those were not used, any of them, for electric school buses. Uh, I want to show you that surrounding states did make that choice. Um, you can see here, these were initial allocations. Since uh, this, Illinois has, is devoting an additional 27 million for electric school buses in addition to that, which is shown on this, on this map. So what's happened is in the Midwest, you'll see the commitments that have been made. This is as of this summer, so it may be slightly out of date, but this, as of this summer, these were the commitments made across the Midwest um, for electric school buses. Almost all of those are due to VW settlement dollars contributing towards electric school buses in these states. Um, so the VW money is time limited as are you know, most settlements. Uh, so that led uh, those of us who've been pushing for electric school bus options for schools to look to the federal government. And there has been, and many of you may be familiar with a Diesel Emission Reduction Act. It's a program that's been going on for years that's been used in some cases to, for instance, add filters to school buses. It's been used to upgrade um, various other types of diesel equipment. Um, good stuff, but it has not um, been used very often because of the match requirements, which are significant uh, for school buses. Um, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which we'll get into, um, is the big new funding pot um, for electric school buses. And we'll go into that in detail. And then more recently, the Inflation Reduction Act has some components which can also help uh, with electric school buses. Um, so the infrastructure law, um, part of that huge bill uh, created a new program at the US EPA called the Clean School Bus Program. It specifically set aside um, half of a new $5 billion program. It's a $5 billion program over five years. It set aside half of that for electric and half for alternative or so-called clean school buses, um, which electric qualify for, but as did propane and CNG. Separately, um, there's a provision related to electric vehicle infrastructure which again, is not, that is not focused on school buses, uh, but state plans for how to use that money, which is through the state DOTs, could be helpful to um, the charging related to some electric school buses. We'll get into that too. Um, so I mentioned that the EPA created this program um, under, the infra under the infrastructure law. The $5 billion program EPA intended to spend 500 million in the first round of funds, which were to be last summer. They were overwhelmed in their own words by the response. 
While they had said they were gonna spend 500 million, the applications they received were $4 billion worth, over 95% of which were for electric school buses. They were frankly shocked, um, but pleased uh, with the response. They then decided instead of putting out 500 million, they would spend 1 billion, the first, uh, the allow amount they, they were allowed to spend within the first year of the program. Uh, all 50 states, um, as well as numerous tribes and territories all applied for electric school buses. Um, this is the map of Wisconsin. I hope you can see it. Um, and the, the different colors show the applications that were for electric, those are the orange towers and those that were for purple. As you can see, as with across the country, most are for electric school buses. And these are showing not just the applications from Wisconsin, but the awards. The program was called a rebate program that's kind of a misnomer because at least you and I think of a rebate program where you pay in advance and then you get reimbursed later. This is actually a rebate program where the money is set aside um, once the school district um, puts in the purchase order for whatever number of school uh, buses they were awarded or fewer if they choose fewer. Um, and then they will get the money or the money will go directly to the manufacturer so that the school district will not have to put the money up front and will not have to float bonds or whatever it would have taken from the school district budget to be able to actually pay for the electric school buses. These awards were very generous um, for a priority district. There, there's a whole thing there about a priority districts and non-priority districts, but priority districts, which were most of the applicants, um, the award was for up to 375,000 for an electric school bus, which should cover it, and up to 20,000 for the related charging equipment, which should cover the costs of a level two charger, um, probably not a level of DC fast charger. Um, so um, these, these were the awards um, announced in Wisconsin. Um, as I say, and Greg alluded to, this means Wisconsin was gonna go from zero to 65 in no seconds flat because um, Wisconsin had no electric school buses and um, once these um, schools are able to obtain the buses through these awards, there can be up to 65. Uh, these are 65 buses awarded over 15 school districts across the state. Um, we were really pleased uh, to see the um, interest uh, expressed in Wisconsin. Um, I believe there were a, an additional uh, 27 uh, school districts in Wisconsin which applied for electric school buses and did not, um, well, you can see here this map, which I realize is really hard to see, but you'll see all these little dots. Um, a lot of priority districts, um, many also applied, but weren't able to be awarded through the lottery um, across the country, but including uh, here in, in Wisconsin. Let's see. Um, okay, oops, excuse me. Uh, so I mentioned to the Inflation Reduction Act, um, this is um, this act, which is even newer, um, and the details of which, frankly, have not yet been announced by the Treasury Department, um, creates a new program for heavy duty vehicles, um, which is aimed again at electrification. It is not aimed at specifically school buses, but could include and could support some school buses. There are other class six and seven vehicles which also apply. It is not clear how that money is going to be rolled out. Um, it also creates and amends a commercial vehicle tax credit that um, could be helpful for electric school buses and specifically for school districts. They may be able to um, get a tax credit, um, even though many of them are non-taxed uh, organizations or institutions, um, but there may be rebates and uh, awards that can help them as well. And lastly, there's um, some vehicle charging equipment changes that also could impact electric school buses. So um, Greg asked um, what some of the things are that can do to help um, things happen um, in Wisconsin. Um, I, I wanted to list and let you all know right here that uh, four states across the US this year implemented or adopted legislation setting themselves on a schedule to transition their entire school bus fleets. New York, which has one of the biggest fleets uh, in the country, I think second only to California, has made the commitment to 
uh, entirely switch all of the school buses in New York by 2020, excuse me, all new school bus purchased um, by 2027 would be electric and the entire fleet across the state would be electric by 2035. Connecticut, each, each of these is a slightly different tweak, but I just wanted you to see these. Um, Connecticut, uh, the commitment is to all the, the entire fleet electric by 2040 with an interim earlier date uh, for those in operating in environmental justice communities. In Maryland, it's a straight all new school buses um, by 2025. And in Maine, 75% uh, of new school buses by 2035. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. It's the kind of thing that we're thinking about um, in Illinois, haven't yet done, but I wanted to let you know that. One of the things um, Greg asked um, was what some of the things could be done in Wisconsin to help the transition of school bus fleets um, there. The first thing I would suggest is to help support those 15 school districts which were awarded electric school buses. Um, they may well not be ready. Um, what we've seen across the country is that many school districts applied and are eager, but are in areas where the electric vehicle charging equipment is not there and, and or the utilities are not ready. Um, in Wisconsin, I know there's a variety of electric utilities. My guess, but you may be able to tell me differently, is that some are more readier than others to help um, any electric vehicle owners, whether they be school bus operators, individual car owners, transit buses, et cetera. Um, but um, these uh, school districts um, may need both public support and support behind the scenes to actually carry through and, and make the best of those awards. Um, Related to that is uh, ensuring that the electric utilities, munis and co-ops are ready and are helping with the charging infrastructure, both the actual equipment, but also with tariffs or rates uh, that allow um, and, and encourage um, electric vehicles, including school buses. Um, related to the charging equipment also, Wisconsin DOT is getting millions of dollars through the so-called NEVI plan. Um, and those plans in most states um, are really focused on the charging equipment needs for cars. They are in most cases not focused on the needs of medium and heavy duty vehicles, which would include transit buses, school buses, um, vehicles carrying or hauling um, like Ford 150s carrying you know, a trailer with snow, you know, ski doos and stuff on them. Um, so for those, in order to meet those needs, the NEVI plan should design some pull through spaces so that these longer vehicles can be accommodated. And if there are any canopies, there should be enough clearance for these larger vehicles, not just built at the height that deal with autos. Um, secondly, I mentioned that the first round of the uh, infrastructure law money um, and the awards, uh, there will be multiple more rounds of those monies. This first one I mentioned was so-called rebates. The next round, which is expected to be um, announced in February or March, will be for um, grants. Those will be, frankly, a little more complicated, um, but any um, school districts that work together, um, that do joint purchases or bulk purchases, or that show that a number of school districts are working together are likely to be favorably looked upon by EPA. There will be many fewer awards. There will be bigger awards for a larger number of buses. And so the collaboration between school districts, uh, whether even if they're across county lines uh, or whatever, but across the state will be looked upon favorably. Uh, lastly, the related to this slide I showed earlier, um, setting a goal or a timetable in Wisconsin for school buses to go electric um, would definitely be uh, so, uh, something to shoot for. Um, lastly, I've been presumptuous enough to make a list of potential allies across this effort in Wisconsin. Um, you all know many of these organizations. Um, any of you who are um, who may be interested in helping to make this transition happen in Wisconsin, these may be some potential allies, and uh, you, no doubt you will know of others. Um, so I'm going to uh, say now this is our vision of. Uh, how school bus transportation can be handled in the future, relying upon renewable energy um, and making the ride safe for both kids, the communities through, the through which the buses drive, um, as well as the drivers and staff. Um, I'm gonna try to uh, now end so we can move on to um, Trevor and to questions in the future. 
Whoops. Awesome. This is how to contact me. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, and I will get this screen share. There we go. Um, yeah, so thank you for that, Susan. Really, that was actually, that's amazing. There's so much information in there and I really appreciate you uh, kind of breaking down the situation for us. You know, as a kid who was a regular bus uh, rider for the school bus, uh, you know, it makes a huge difference for kids. It's a, you know, uh, it sets the tone for how you start and end your day as well as, you know, I can think about, um, you know, riding a diesel bus in the 90s, um, you know, that can still kind of smell that now every once in a while. So, you know, it is it is a, a real concept. And so uh, very, and it's going to be a big deal for a lot of kids and for um, school districts across the state. And I'm you got my brain thinking about uh, Wisconsin committing to a school bus um, uh, commitment to all electric, especially given our governor's, um, you know, love of education and uh, how that's a priority area for them. It really could be a, uh, something to, um, it's getting it's getting some things rolling. So thank you for that. It's so much information in there. Um, and now I'll throw it over to Trevor to kind of share some of the experience that's happening at the municipal level um, in Racine. He's been a real leader on this subject. So I'm uh, just excited to see what he's got to share for us. So take it away, Trevor. Thank you very much, Greg. And let me get my screen share working here. All right, can everybody see my screen? Looks good. All right, excellent. So first off, I just wanna say thank you to a thousand friends of Wisconsin. What an organization and the work that they do to make sure that they champion sustainable land use and transportation to make sure that the state of Wisconsin is a real leader. Uh, I know that the city of Racine uh, wouldn't be able to do this type of work without nonprofit organizations making this top of mind for our citizenry. So when you have residents who believe in the values of sustainability and talk to their local elected leaders, that really gets the ball mo moving, or in this case, gets the wheels moving uh, to make sure that we can be a more sustainable community. And that's happening across the city of Wisconsin because of the work of Greg and Deb and all those who are involved in A Thousand Friends of Wisconsin. Uh, so my name is Trevor Young. I'm the Transit Mobility Director uh, for the city of Racine. I've been in this role for about uh, two years now. And before that was on the city council for two terms, uh, chairing the Transit Commission. So. The conversation that we're going to have today is going to be around what has the city of Racine done so far and what does that look like from both a governance perspective and also uh, in practice and really getting into the nuts and bolts of what it takes to make this type of operation work and learn more about uh, the technology itself. Uh, but before I dive into that, I do want to tell the story uh, a bit about Racine. You know, Racine is centrally located between Milwaukee and Chicago historic downtown, award-winning architecture, one of the top 10 freshwater beaches in the country, a diverse population, large enough where you can discover new things, small enough where you know your neighbor. Uh, and it has an incredible history of uh, innovation. Uh, at one point, we had more patents per capita in the city of Racine than anywhere else in the United States of America. And so the way that we approach our work in local government is with that same spirit of innovation. What can we do to make folks' lives better? and do things differently and not necessarily be afraid of changing things up, even if it means diving into new technologies uh, that may be unfamiliar. So that's really the story of Racine, and that's also the story of what we're gonna talk about today, which is the electrification of our transit system. So Ride Racine uh, actually has 35 fixed route buses that operate um, every day. We've got 10 routes, we've got paratransit service, we have a KRM commuter bus service that operates from the intermodal station in Milwaukee to downtown Racine, then to the metro station in Kenosha. And we provide pre-pandemic uh, just over a million rides a year. And so we're really excited to be able to, to jump into electrification because we see it as a critical way to improve our service through service, sustainability, and savings. So what are the benefits of electric buses and multimodal transportation generally. So in the city of Racine, ride Racine buses uh, that are diesel consume about 6,340 gallons of diesel per year, uh, or yeah, per bus. So each bus emits about 64.4 metric tons of CO2 annually. So uh, Greg pointed out that we're growing our fleet. We've got the largest electric fleet in operation in the city of Wisconsin with nine. We've got four more on the way. So that will bring 13 all electric buses uh, operational in the state 
in the city of Racine uh, moving into the end of next year. And so that means that we're going to be able to save uh, about eight, 82,420 gallons of diesel a year, which means 837 metric tons of CO2 saved from the atmosphere. So that's almost 40% of our fleet, and that means real benefits for the environment. So imagine having each transit system in the state and the country looking at this as a way to fight climate change. Uh, and transit systems are one of the largest consumers of fossil fuels. So to have that mindset uh, going to this work is, is critical. Uh, it's great for public health. And Susan pointed out, and rightfully so, that this is, this is about the air you breathe. This is about the quality of education that you have access to. This is about the quality of life in your community. So um, as a public service, we've got to look at this beyond uh, bringing people from point A to point B, but what can we do to make sure that folks' quality of life is better? So having that consideration definitely was an, uh, uh, an element in making sure that we engage in this work. Access and connectivity is critical. In the city of Racine, we're in the third largest economic region in the United States between Milwaukee and Chicago, the 10th largest economic region in the world. Yet we've faced stubborn unemployment, we've faced stubborn poverty. So imagine what we could do with the savings that are associated with going electric and what that could mean to enhance system, enhance our system, connect folks to jobs, connect folks to care, connect folks to recreation. We've got the economic engine of southeastern Wisconsin in the Chicago and Milwaukee region. So what we could do with those savings is make sure that people have access to opportunities. So this even goes beyond just the bare discussion around uh, converting from diesel to electric. This means that savings should translate into better service. Uh, in the rider and driver experience, our new uh, all electric buses are replacing uh, 12 year old diesel buses that had over 500,000 miles on them each. And so we're grateful to be able to in partnership with the state and federal government, be able to update our fleet, make sure that our rider experience is more positive and that our drivers are know that their value as well, it's sitting behind the wheel of uh, what really is pretty incredible technology. Uh, and then from an economic perspective, uh, it just makes sense. Uh, in 2021, uh, the city of Racine's transit system spent just over $500,000 on diesel alone. So imagine cutting that by 25%, which is what we currently have on the street right now, 25% of our fleet being electric. Imagine cutting that by 40%, which is what we're gonna have with four new buses on the way. And we're going to be incorporating a solar uh, into our operations. So that's gonna be some real net saving that you're gonna see uh, with our transit system. So, and that's 2021 numbers. We're not even talking about uh, the, the increase that we've seen as of late with dirty fossil fuel costs. And this again is about innovation and brand for our public transportation system. Uh, we're seeing an increase in ridership because more people are talking about the bus. It's raising awareness of the service. It's getting people who aren't necessarily traditional riders uh, having conversations about what is happening in mass transit uh, in the city of Racine. And so you're you're garnering more interest. Uh, as of late, uh, we have new partnerships that have come out of the, the transit system with uh, Gateway Technical College, our local technical college, now participating in uh, paying for their students. Now, that conversation started with Gateway Technical College saying, how cool is it that you're doing this type of work of, around electrification? So the benefits go beyond operational savings and environmental sustainability. You're, we've seen this as a way to promote uh, the system as well. And in, in, Enhance the brand. So let's talk about the bus basics. Let's have a conversation about what actually goes into this. So, uh, and what's happening in the city of Racine. So currently we have nine uh, all electric Proterra buses that have about 450 kilowatt hours of energy on board. So these buses have dual power uh, motors resulting in twice uh, the brake regeneration, providing maximum range on a single charge. Uh, through route modeling data that we've received from our manufacturer and what we've seen uh, operating our buses in the city of Racine, we've got about 175 miles on an average day uh, with our charge, which is great for the city of Racine because none of our peak hour services reach that level 
of mileage. So that means that they can operate throughout the day, then we can make sure that they charge overnight when rates are lower because there's less of a demand on the utility. And so these buses are a purpose-built composite uh, body that has non-corrosive and non-conductive uh, technology. So the body really is also designed around the battery pack uh, for passenger safety and uh, optimal bus performance. So the composite body is uh, lighter and stronger than a traditional conductive steel bus. And it's also better insulated. So uh, just like a Yeti cooler that you would use. Uh, and we actually use um, an, our supplement heat for uh, auxiliary heat on the bus so that we have more battery range. Uh, as battery technology improves, I think we're gonna le need less of that, but instead of uh, burning hundreds of gallons of fuel on a, on a single day in the coldest winter months, we would burn about eight gallons with that uh, auxiliary heat. Um, that can make sure that we have that proper range. So uh, that is uh, essentially the, the build of the, the bus. And the, the exciting thing is that we're also uh, installing a 1.2 a megawatt charger uh, on our, at our garage with 10 dispensers. So we're gonna be able to um, charge those buses overnight and with solar. So the Solar integration is exciting, and this is an opportunity for me to express gratitude for Senator Baldwin, who secured $1.235 million in congressional directed spending for the city of Racine to uh, build a, a solar array at our transit garage. So here you see some rendering. So we're currently working on an investment grade audit with the Department of Energy um, to make sure that we're uh, planning this in appropriate uh, course so that we're eligible for these funds. Uh, and once we get that report submitted, we're gonna be the first in the state of Wisconsin to have a solar array contribute to our electric bus fleet at the local level. And over 30 years, we're gonna see approximately $700,000 in savings uh, for this. And annually, we're gonna be able to charge uh, five of our 13 buses completely uh, by the power of the sun. Uh, and the great thing about this uh, infrastructure from a physical perspective is also because it's a canopy style, it's going to be uh, protect our fleet vehicles uh, from the elements uh, during the, those Wisconsin days where you can't predict the weather. Uh, and we're integrating smart um, city technology for energy modeling associated with this infrastructure so that we know exactly what those savings are, what energy is being produced, how much is that contributing to the operations of our fleet. And um, it's an exciting project that we're extraordinarily grateful for, that we're just beginning the planning process now after securing those funds. So speaking of securing funds, uh, this doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and I think Susan really put this into perspective that this is a long-term solution, but we've got to start somewhere. We've got to start as soon as possible if we're going to address the concerns of, of climate change and that we all have a responsibility towards. So this began uh, before my time in this role. And so I wanna give credit to Mike Meyerly, my predecessor, uh, Kara Pratt, who is the sustainability coordinator for the city of Racine at the time for securing these early dollars in our vehicle fleet transition. So in November, uh, 2018, we saw about $1.2 million from the Volkswagen settlement agreement from the city of Racine for our EV program in 2020, in 2020, we saw 3.2 come from the Federal Transit uh, Administration's uh, LONO program. We built on that with uh, additional dollars in 2020 through the Volkswagen Settlement uh, Agreement. And then uh, most recently, bringing the total of nine buses to 13 by the end of next year, uh, we secured $3.2 million from the LONO program. And I want to thank Susan again for pointing out that now's the time. Strike while the iron is hot because the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, provides 20 times more dollars for this type of infrastructure than the previous uh, five-year program. So there's $1.1 billion annually that's available for this type of uh, fleet transition across the country. And uh, that's $5.3 billion over the next five years. So now's the time to engage in this work uh, and begin that planning process. So in November of 
2018, the city of Racine worked with uh, consultants to make sure that we put together a, a plan around EV, uh, this EV transition. And the federal government is going to have those expectations around planning. So um, in order to be eligible for funds, uh, especially now with the Biden administration, uh, there's a Justice 40 initiative. So to be able to communicate about the, not just the environmental benefits, of EV, but the social justice benefits uh, are going to be critical if you're a municipality applying for these funds. So what did it look like to implement uh, this after receiving these dollars? So uh, we had our manufacturing partner, uh, Proterra, and the city of Racine uh, facilitate conversations around pr production, logistics, planning. We worked closely with our utility, having those open lines of communication uh, with your utility is going to be critical so that you can identify potential savings and make sure that you're coordinating um, from a project management perspective on folks being on site, because this really is different infrastructure. Our bus barn that we have is was built, I believe, in the 1960s. So uh, the electrical that went into that facility and the new um, infrastructure that you need, you're going to have to be coordinated with those other players and partners that are at the table. So uh, November through December of 2021, those nine all electric buses with lease batteries and associated charging infrastructure was delivered. Uh, spring of 2022, uh, we were able to put them into revenue service after training, maintenance and inspection. So we've got to train our drivers and how we, they best uh, utilize the regenerative braking. You have to train first responders to make sure that they know, um, you know, what safety protocol exists if there are ever issues with the bus. We've got to train our technicians, our mechanics uh, on this technology. And so from 2021 in the spring of 2022, um, it was an all hands on deck moment to make sure that we were prepared to roll these buses out for revenue service. And then in winter of 2023, we're gonna see the delivery of four electric buses with battery warranty uh, delivered. And because of that training that we have, we're gonna be prepared to put those buses on the road after that proper uh, maintenance and, and inspection. Something that I would recommend from an operational perspective that we've uh, worked out with our, our manufacturing partner is having an on-site technician uh, in your launch. So to have somebody who's working, uh, who's working for the manufacturer who's on your on the payroll for them, but on your uh, your site, on your campus daily to address any small issues, to make sure that there's a year of ongoing training for your permanent staff so that once that year period is over, that they're going to be able to um, know what those issues are. So that's fortunately also built into the LONO program where there's workforce development. So the way that we wrote our grant was to ensure that we could provide that year of training, that on-site technician to be able to provide that support uh, to our team. And that has made a world of difference for us in the city of Racine to be able to get these buses on the road. Now, the, there are the two word uh, crisis that we've heard lately, which is supply chain. So of course there are going to be supply chain issues. So whatever timeline you think is going to be uh, appropriate, make sure you add, <laughs> add some months to that timeline. And that's true for us with our charging infrastructure. But if you've got that relationship with your utility, with your manufacturing partner, you can find short term solutions with temporary chargers to make sure you can get those buses on the road. So the exciting thing is that this doesn't happen uh, just from an operational perspective. You need to engage your community. You need to engage your elected officials. And that's where 1000 Friends of Wisconsin is such an important ally in this work. Uh, in the city of Racine, when we uh, launched our bus, our EV bus program in April, the governor came down, Secretary Thompson of the Department of Transportation came down and celebrated um, the first EV fleet to operate uh, in the state of Wisconsin and to provide service to the public. And so uh, this was critical from this, that, that support from the governor's administration and from Senator Baldwin, who also wrote letters of support for our LONO. Uh, application initially. Uh, but let's have a real conversation. This is a local service and this is a municipal uh, governance. And so to have local elected officials at the table is uh, just, if not more critical 
to have their buy-in and investment. And fortunately in the city of Racine, uh, they've made that commitment to environmental stewardship and to quality uh, service and sustainability. And so uh, the city of Racine, when the federal government stepped away from the Paris Climate Accord, uh, the previous presidential administration stepped up and said, we're going to make these ambitious goals around reducing our carbon footprint. And because of that, it set the stage for the transit system to be able to make these investments and pursue these grant dollars. So I want to thank the city of Racine's Common Council and Mayor Mason for the work that they've done, the leadership that they've shown in this space. But what's, what's also very exciting, I'm not gonna show the video here, but the city of Racine produced a music video where we did the electric slide with our new electric ride. And so I encourage everybody to go on YouTube and or the city of Racine's Facebook page or Ride Racine's Facebook page and uh, check out the community coming together to promote uh, the transit system and promote this new technology because this isn't just about uh, the system. This is about the community. This isn't just about the technology. This is about the service that you're providing. So to raise awareness, take it as a win, promote your system, get folks interested in this work uh, is, is just as important. And you've done so much work to make this happen. I tell my, my colleagues that you got to talk about it and scream it from the rooftops. So, um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this presentation and uh, to be invited to this forum and look forward to the questions that you have for me. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Trevor. Um, so cool. I, I, you know, thank you for your leadership on this. I mean, there's a reason why Racine is at the forefront of, you know, electric buses in the state. And it's amazing. I'm I, I'm so excited. I mean, electric buses powered by solar is something that's just uh, inspiring. It's really amazing. So thank you for, you know, your leadership on that, and, and thank you, um, Susan as well for everyone here. I, thank you for for coming out. I mean, these are some two real experts. This has been an awesome webinar, and we're gonna you know open it up to chat now uh, for any questions that are on there. Um, you know, and and just a quick reminder too that you know this is a, a series of uh, you know. <clears throat> webinar series that a thousand friends is doing we're going to be doing this into 2023 so just keep an eye out for some of these uh, webinars as we kind of um you know look at 2023 which is going to be as you both mentioned a, a huge year striking while the iron is hot there's a ton of money coming in from the federal government how we're going to spend that is going to be a big deal so you know we're looking to maybe do webinars um, on infrastructure money on you know passenger rail it's going to be a big year for that um, of course, it's the state budget as well. So there's just a ton going on. Um, so, you know, just wanted to, you know, highlight that. Keep an eye out for our stuff. Join our, our newsletter. Follow us on social media. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I'm going to throw it over uh, just to Trevor and, and Susan. And so folks, get your questions in the chat if you've got them. But I'm curious for your both, uh, your thoughts on kind of the refrain I hear most commonly when it comes to electric buses and Wisconsin is those cold winters. Um, you know, so how are you uh, finding these electric buses and electric school buses are um, operating kind of with the, the those cold, harsh Wisconsin winters we hear a lot about? Um, Susan or Trevor, I don't know if one of you wants to take the lead on that, but. I'll, I'll jump in on school buses and then Trevor can go with um, transit buses. How about? So um, this is a, something we hear about all the time, but here's what I can tell you. There's an electric school bus operating in Alaska at temperatures that are even colder than Wisconsin's. There are multiple electric school buses operating in Michigan. There are multiple operating in Minnesota. You get the idea. What we hear from talking to those operators is it's not a problem. Um, the only thing that ever comes up <clears throat> as a potential issue is the heating required does mean that the range may be reduced if the heating equipment is also electric and running off the same battery. Some electric school buses have small diesel heaters, which are use only a few gallons, so it's still a massive reduction. Um, Many only have electric heaters, and so there can be a reduction in range. But even, I mean, these places I've mentioned, they've all consistently said it's not a problem. It's a good question, but turns out not to be a problem. Trevor? Agreed, and uh, couldn't have said it better. In the city of Racine, we've got auxiliary heat, as Susan um, alluded to, where we have an eight gallon diesel engine that only in the coldest of days, that thing turns on. So instead of burning hundreds and thousands of gallons, 
of diesel a year, um, you'd have that eight gallon tank that would just address that concern on the coldest of days in Wisconsin. But uh, we've got, as Susan said, buses running in Duluth, buses running in, electric buses running in Canada and Alaska. So we're seeing seems like a walk in the park compared to those places. Oh, one other thing related to what Trevor just said. Um, one of the major manufacturers of electric school buses to date <clears throat> is a Canadian-based company. That might answer the question right there, Lion Electric. And they're uh, currently building a facility in Joliet, Illinois, which will be making only electric heavy duty trucks and school buses. Uh, the first one's already complete. So there will be some made close by to Wisconsin um, that are uh, Canadian based uh, properties dealing with cold weather. Well, that's great. I mean, that's great to hear. And, you know, that's obviously just a kind of a common concern I hear. But yeah, as you've mentioned, it hasn't quite manifested, I think, the way a lot of people's fears have, which is awesome to hear. Um, again, feel free to throw your uh, comments or questions into the chat. We'll try and get through them. I, I see a number of folks on here, some familiar faces, some members. Uh, I see Jeff from uh, Milwaukee County Transit System I was saw yesterday, some, some really you know, great folks here today. Um, Susan, I, I know, I don't, I, did I miss any questions along the way? You've got one for us? Oh, I had one, but I just saw one come in the chat. Um, so maybe let's just go with that person's first. So regarding the grants um, for EV school buses, um, John says, if I saw that map right, it appeared that most of the, oopsie, Sorry, another question coming in. Applications were for remote areas of Wisconsin. When it's think about the e ecological benefits, it seems that Milwaukee and Madison would benefit the most based on pollution. Any thoughts on why those most polluted areas didn't receive, didn't apply or receive any school bus grants? And I just, one of my questions I'll just tack on to the end of that is I know some school districts do not own their school buses, they contract with companies. So I don't know how that impacts that whole process and the eligibility. So two great questions, um, and these are ongoing issues that we have with EPA over the program. So under the infrastructure law, EPA was given three areas that it had to prioritize um, these, elect these clean school bus grants or rebates, whatever. Um, one was high need, we'll get to that. Another was tribal and a third was rural. They had to then pick data sets to decide what would qualify as high need, tribal, rural. The lists that they chose for rural were huge. And it meant that the pool of so-called priority school districts was more than half rural districts. And since it's a lottery, if, you, if more than half the pool is small rural school districts, guess what happens when you pull names out of a hat? Well over half, in fact, it looks like 62% of the electric school buses are gonna be going to rural communities. Now the high need list, um, EPA decided to use a, a metric or a, a database called SAIPE, school, Small Area Income, and I can never remember the rest of it. It's a, it's a database that combines a whole bunch of different factors, um, some of which, um, and, and comes out with a ranking of um, the poverty associated with a school district. But I can tell you that for many of us, it doesn't make sense. And I'll give you an example that's close to my current home. Um, I live in Chicago. In Chicago now, I used to live in Wisconsin. Um, in Chicago now, more than 69% of Chicago public school students qualify for free and reduced lunch. By the SAIPE indicator that they used, Chicago public schools came out as only 20% of students in poverty. Or excuse me, 19.9%. And the cutoff that EPA used was 20%. Now in most programs, something that's 19.99, which is what Chicago came out, would be rounded to 20, but Chicago did not make the priority list. Neither did Minneapolis, another one you might know. Um, now, I also wanted to add about Madison, Milwaukee, et cetera. We have been urging EPA to add um, school districts that are in non-attainment areas. That would certainly cover Milwaukee, Racine, Kenosha, because of ozone, ongoing ozone issues there. Um, it's not clear that they will, um, but I can tell you that Madison and Milwaukee and Middleton um, Cross Plains um, did apply. Uh, they just didn't happen to win the lottery. 
So a number of school districts um, in Wisconsin that are that you that are urban did try, and I would urge them, since they were thoughtful enough to apply the first time, to put together applications the next time because um, there's more money coming. Sorry for the long answer, and I oh, I may have forgotten. Oh, you also asked about uh, about school districts that lease or contract. Um, those school districts can work with their contractors uh, to apply. Um, many of the largest contractors, such as First Student, which is in 40 different states, serving some schools in 40 different states, did apply for the priority districts, um, and many were winners. Um, so school districts that lease or contract should not give up. Um, they, can, they can apply. It just it takes an extra amount of coordination. Fantastic. Um... We're gonna do some quick lightning round questions here as we get to the last minute. Everyone kind of got uh, unshy right at the end. So really quickly, um, is there, how are your organizations publicizing this? And there's a lot of great news coming out about these awards. How can uh, people support that and kind of share this great news? Trevor? Yeah, I, I do it creatively. I think that uh, there are, are great ways that you can do it traditionally through your local media, through partnering with your local television stations. CBS 58 has a show called Racine and Me. So we've been on Racine and Me a couple of times talking about our electric bus program. But you know why they invited us on the show? Because they saw the cool music video. They said, this is great. Come on by. This is the perfect kind of coffee morning thing to chat about. So to have fun <laughs> while at the same time doing good work uh, is going to get people talking. So whether it's your local paper or you know social media, uh, quick videos or being a part of your like holiday parades. I mean, the great thing about your smaller cities like Racine uh, is that you can, we were in the St. Patrick's Day Parade with our electric bus. We were in the holiday parade with our electric bus. We were in the 4th of July parade with our electric bus, which we've got the largest 4th of July parade in the Midwest. So be present, be public and do fun things and people will start talking. Totally agree. Ride and drive. See if your um, school district that won an award will invite the manufacturer uh, and have a ride and drive. People can participate, see what it's like, see how quiet they are, and all the things that Trevor suggested. Yeah, and bring in dignitaries as well. Yes. Because they, they, they attract press and they'll be able to promote the work. And many of them actually voted for these funds, so they should get some credit, like yeah. Trevor gave to Senator Baldwin. Um, okay, uh, where is the technology uh, kind of as it relates to the last mile? So I don't know if you guys, either of you have any knowledge about small capacity electric buses or vans. Trevor, do you want to go for this? I, I, would, I would even go beyond um, vans and cars and say bike share, scooter share. What can we do to get people outside of their cars to address those last mile solutions is going to be critical. What can we do? You know, thanks to a thousand friends of Wisconsin to create a built environment where it's not necessarily reliant on the automobile uh, to address those concerns is going to be the, the key. Absolutely agree. Okay, and then the last question here as we run out uh, and then uh, close to one, I want to respect everyone's time. So uh, it said Susan showed a graphic early in her presentation that discussed a comparison of power for school buses, and it showed charged on Minnesota grid versus charged with renewables. Can you explain these two items um, and, and why was this uh, differentiation presented? Sure. Um, our electric grid is changing over time in terms of the sources. Um, over time, coal-fired power plants are gradually phasing out, um, and renewables, solar, wind, etc., are ramping up. Um, so that's that, that chart was meant to show, you know, at the present time, what the overall Minnesota grid is, or, you know, the overall Minnesota electric mix of sources is, and how it's changing towards renewable, and how as, as that grid or that part of the grid gets cleaner, uh, it's an interactive thing with transportation sources. It, it fits also with what Trevor was saying. It's the same thing is true for transit buses and, um, and automobiles as we move to electric and and as the electric uh, grid gets cleaner, the two things are mutually reinforcing. And let me add one thing about electric school buses. Um, electric school buses are unique in that their duty cycle is such that they don't operate 
during the times, the peak times of electricity use in this country. For the most part, they don't operate in the summer when our electric peak is, and they don't operate, and this, is part, this part is like transit buses, they don't operate at night when the electricity is cheapest. Um, with electric school buses, um, we are looking towards vehicle to grid, where these electric school buses can basically feed energy back into the grid at the times of peak need. Well, fantastic. Um, thank you both, Susan and Trevor, uh, leaders in their respective fields on this issue. We're so lucky to have you. So much knowledge and expertise. Thank you for making time, everybody. Uh, yeah, please give them a round of applause uh, with those uh, in the chat. And then um, we will be, we've recorded this, we'll be sending out the recording to all of you. Um, and we'll be, you know, adding links to the, the music video that Trevor mentioned to the um, you know, uh, Environmental Law and Policy Center, where Susan works, just so much awesome stuff here. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you all. Thank you.